and we can get started even as people begin to enter from the waiting room. All right, so good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Johan Matthews, I serve as a community engagement facilitator here at the Co-op Fund and just want to share my gratitude for you guys choosing to spend your time today learning with us. Uh, today's session is called Now You Know, and it's kind of a deep dive on co-op principle number five. Background buddy's excited, you probably heard him just now. So it's a pretty big deal. And so we just appreciate you guys being here with us. Now, the title is a little uh, fun, but a little deceptive as well, because today is all about recognizing what you already know and how can you get started using affirmation and leveraging what your team knows and, and recognizing the limits of what we don't know so we can fill the gaps. And by the end of this session, we're hoping that folks can understand why training information is a core principle in the cooperative movements and cooperative structure. We're learning how we can meet members where they are and you know educate and inform them effectively. And we're hoping to identify needs for your own education practice in your cooperative enterprise or in your future attempts to try to upskill your members and communicate to the public what they need to know about your, your institution and the cooperative movement in general. So today we're gonna to do an overview of P5, of education training information. And we're gonna, again, talk about the what and why. We're gonna frame it around the popular education model. Maybe you've heard of that. We're gonna talk about the importance of making it visible. And we're gonna hopefully spend a good amount of time thinking about how you can implement education, training and information in your own co-op. And we'll wrap up with some questions as well. So pass it over to my co-host, Carolyn. Hi everybody, I'm Carolyn Edsilvetter. I'm a cooperative business support person at Cooperative Fund of New England. Um, and uh, I think everybody on this call, y'all yeah, are already familiar, most of you are borrowers, which is awesome. Um, but you know, just to say that today is really about practicing what we preach. Uh, so we're talking about education, training, and information, and that's one of our big goals is to make sure that all different types of co-ops throughout the Northeast um, have the information that they need and the know-how to be able to found and run successful co-ops. Um, so we're really glad to have you with us today for that. And um, just a little background. Um, on the cooperative principles as a whole. So um, they have been sort of formalized by the International Cooperative Alliance, um, which was founded in England in the late 1800s. But um, they really are somewhat universal principles um, that are, you know, these, these values of cooperation and of self-help and mutual aid, um, you know, really are sort of cross-cultural. So uh, we wanna be really clear that, you know, the co-op principles are sort of the international modern way that we've formalized what our values are um, in this movement, but they're not the end all be all and they, you know, sort of pre-existed this articulation. And they're also constantly being updated. So like right now there's uh, a move to add an eighth principle um, of, uh, of racial equity, you know, I think they're working on how they're gonna formulate that, but um, it really is some sort of an ongoing um, evolution of how we, define what we're about as cooperators. And of course, the reason we're all here is to engage and, and deepen our practice in creating and sustaining cooperative enterprise. So what is a co-op? You know, uh, I think all of us here may have some clue, but for those of us who would like a refresher, we're thinking of an organization that is autonomous, that is created to meet the common needs and aspirations of their members and those members jointly own and democratically control the institution. So, you know, that's really what we're thinking about, an organization that's user owned, user controlled, and intended to benefit that user, that, that community of users. And so just a quick overview of that. And we've covered two principles in the, uh, we covered the first four principles in two different sessions this year. Um, this is our third session on these principles on education training information today. And then we'll have at least one more combining the last two principles before the year is over. So look out for that. So 
So this is just the sort of official articulation of this principle. Um, Co-ops provide education and training for members, elected representatives, managers, and employees, so they can contribute effectively to the development of their co-op. Um, they inform the general public, particularly young people and opinion leaders about the nature and benefit of cooperation. So there's sort of two parts. There's this, you know, internal to the co-op, making sure that everybody, wherever their, whatever their background is equipped to participate fully and exercise leadership. And then this external part of why, why are co-ops beneficial? Why are they a good way to organize yourselves to meet common needs? Okay, so we're gonna go right into an activity here. Um, and we're really trying to sort of model in how we're doing this, um, some examples of how you can do more engaging education. Um, you know, humbly, I hope that we'll be you know, somewhat effective at that. We're certainly not the experts, but um, we're gonna go into breakouts in a minute and um, put you in pairs. And um, I invite you to, uh, you know, think about what comes to mind just from your own experience when you hear the words education and training. Um, does that bring up a particular feeling in your body? Does it bring up a memory or an emotion or an experience that you've had with, with training and education? Um, and then once you've shared about that, also thinking about um, what's something that you can do or avoid doing to make education more effective in your co-op. Um, so we're gonna give you about five minutes in breakouts and I'm gonna just paste, um, paste that prompt in the chat. And that should go with you into your breakouts. Any questions before we go to breakouts about what you're gonna be doing? Oh, and Johan, uh, Sarah's asking if you can put her and Barbara in the same room since they're in the same co-op. Oh, because they're actually physically in the same room. <laughs> Good point. How long will we be in the breakout session? About five minutes. Okay. So you should be able to, you know, both do some sharing about your experiences with education and also um, think about what you should start or stop doing. Awesome. See you at five. Magic. Will the rooms close automatically or do we need to pull them back? I'll have to pull them back. Okay. All right, welcome back everybody. I assume most people are back or everybody. Nope, not yet. Huh. I think Barbara and Sarah are just ahead of the game. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. I'll break out rooms close in one second. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. All right. Um, so Let's hear how it went. Um, you can either put in the chat or just let us know out loud. Um, what was something that came up in your group about, um, about this value of training and, and education? What experiences? Yeah, Kevin, uh, shout it out. I think what I heard from all three of us in our group was um, the difference between school education which is what we all remember versus communal education to better our cooperatives and um, that there's a much more intimate relationship in learning together and figuring out how to learn together. Yeah, so even the experience of doing education in a cooperative is a more cooperative experience. You're able to learn from each other rather than sort of like one directional flow of information. Who else? Hmm. 
were there things that you uh, felt like you you needed to do or stop doing from your from your educational experience to to make the translation to a cooperative? We didn't have enough time to go much further than that. Okay. So even in the moment, are, are folks able to summon ideas of what definitely did not work <laughs> when they recollect experiences about education and, and things they know they're not bringing forward or they need to immediately interrupt? I mean, we talked uh, briefly just about the things that don't work on the talking head, you know, just making it really uh, not engaging and really boring and, um, so making sure that it's uh, hands-on and really fun and engaging and memorable things to really uh, make it worth their while. Definitely, definitely. One of the things I shared in the group was um, I'm homeschooling with my kids. And so together we're relearning learning and um, and we're also trying to, with some other families, trying to build a homeschool co-op, but that's, you know, another story. But, um, but just in my relationship with my own kids, um, one of the things that I'm learning, kind of unlearning from the traditional school setting is, um, you know, traditional schools tend to have a, a, a really, you know, more or less rigid kind of predetermined um, program curriculum in place and the students have to fit into that um, and there's you know and I know there's all kinds of pressures and stuff like beyond the schools politics all of that that play a part in that but the freedom that we have homeschooling as you know instead of having you know a fully formed predetermined curriculum, we have um, some, you know, I have some, as a dad and teacher, some frameworks and goals and values that I want to guide this. My kids, they have some things that are important to them um, and things that I they definitely like don't want to do. And then from there, like together, like trying to figure out what's the best route for all of us. You know what I was saying, like that kind of relates because we're like this is all kind of happening in the moment with our co-op group as um, similarly kind of just get into a point of like our common uh, goals and visions and um, and and also like the pitfalls and things that we definitely like don't want to recreate. And then within that, because we're running the business, there are some pressures and like other things, external things that we, you know, need to account for. But, you know, putting all of that into the pot, like collectively, what's the best route? What's the most important information? Um, what is it? Um, one of the guys, I didn't catch your name, the last one who spoke from the housing co-op system, but that's really important too, is... Um, meeting your full potential, like what is what are the things that we think are important to help us meet our full potential? And then and then figuring it out from there and letting it kind of come with those like most important ingredients kind of just kind of happen organically and try and 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 there's gonna be a lot of experimentation. We're gonna try some stuff and learn from that and then kind of regroup. And at least like that's what it looks like right now. You know what I mean? And then Six months from now, I might be telling a different story, but that's kind of where it's at. Yeah, there's some important pieces there about, um, you know, that you're actually starting from who are the learners in the room and what do they want to learn? What are they interested in? And, and um, you know, that it's, it's not about, oh, there's this external standard. It's about what do we need to learn to succeed? And that might be there might be some set of things that are externally imposed, but you're, you're choosing those. You're saying, yeah, we wanna make sure that we hit 
X, Y, and Z standards. Um, anybody else before we shift on to the next part? All right. All right. So this, I mean, Issa, you set this up really well, you know, um, education and training really comes from, as, as, a, as a principle in the co-op movement, really comes from the idea that education is a fundamental right. And um, in particular, we see in the black co-op movement in the US, um, the, that this was so core that some um, consumer co-ops, black consumer co-ops actually funded starting schools in their community to be able to create educational access for young people where you know, there wasn't effective public education. Um, also like with the Rochdale pioneers that started the co-op movement in England, they one of the first things they did was to kind of establish a reading room. So we see the you know, co-ops even before the co-op exists, a lot of the times there's this like formational period of, um, of education and training. Um, next slide. Um, and there are a couple of different pieces to how education functions in co-ops. Um, one is what's going to help members, whatever walk of life they come from, whatever their life experiences, um, whatever limitations sort of social inequity may have put on them, uh, what's going to let them participate fully and be able to, you know, sit on the board, be a board president, be a leader, advance in their jobs, like whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's an internally skilling people up. Um, and also doing the work that the co-op needs you to do. So not everybody learns conflict resolution or how to be a good facilitator, um, but those are things that are really critical skills in a co-op. So um, it's both the, the, the technical, but also the soft skills. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, will you share these slides after? For sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is a structure that was put together by Democracy at Work Institute for worker co-ops, but I think it's really applicable broadly to, to any co-op entity um, in terms of uh, sort of, you know, they say a co-op is like a house. You've got sort of four corner posts, um, power, people, money, and information. And then you've got the foundation, which is the co-op shared mission and values, the wiring, which is the trust, and the current running through that wiring is the participation of all the members. Um, and education and training is really what keeps that current flowing um, by letting people learn the skills that they need to effectively make decisions together and shout, share power um, by helping them interpret information that the co-op's sharing and make meaning out of it and make decisions together. Um, and by understanding what models help the co-op be financially sustainable so they can participate financially. Um, these last few slides are really just more for the notes than anything else, but um, you'll have these to look back at and review. But um, just you know, noting that education is really about um, the broader cooperative movement and how people can participate in it. Uh, training is more the nuts and bolts of how do you do your job, both if you're a worker co-op in the co-op and also all the jobs that go into making the co-op run. Um, and then information um, is both that internal, making sure that you're sharing information with the members and training them up in a way that they can interpret and make use of that information. And then also kind of the public information and education about, about co-ops. So now we're gonna do an activity. And this activity is meant to just play with the idea of communication, right? If trust is the wiring and participation is the current, I would say trust, I would say communication is a switch, is a light switch to see whether or not those lights go on or if those lights dim, you know? And so in the chat, <laughs> you will see a link. And after you click on the link, it'll take you to this slide. And on this slide are the instructions for the activity. So once we put you into breakout groups of two people of breakout group, uh, you'll choose someone to be person A and someone to be person B. 
person A is gonna have to solve a puzzle and person B is gonna help to give instructions to solve that puzzle, okay? They're gonna communicate instructions to solve that puzzle. So do not click on both links, choose who the person who will be solving the puzzle, person A, and the person who will be um, communicating the instructions, person B, before you click on them, okay? So we're gonna put you into breakout groups of two and then you'll be able to solve that. Yep. Before you go to breakout rooms, um, I messed up because uh, I put all the links. So don't click on all the links, just click on the one that says link to the slide and then that will, that will give you the links uh, that Yep. he's talking about. Kevin, did your answer, did your question get answered? Okay, cool, cool. So only that one that says link to slide. So this is the only slide we should be looking at. Okay, once we've seen this, um, can we do the breakout groups? Yep, except right now you're going to a breakout group. So let me fix that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, looks like we're a square. All right. Okay, so hopefully you guys had a little bit of fun and the result was something like this, right? <laughs> and this is an activity I participated in in a, in a, in a recent training, but um, it's something that is clear uh, in a variety of ways to, 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 as far as how you use and leverage communication to bring everybody on the same page. And, you know, I've done this in a, a lot of different ways it's akin to prototyping. And the main thing is, is to realize that people see things differently. People come into the dark room, like the, the wise man summoned by the king, and they're touching different parts of the elephant, right? One wise man thinks it's a snake because he's touching the trunk. Another wise man thinks it's a bull because it's touching the hide. Another thinks, you know, it must be a rhino because it's touching the horn. And, we're all describing the same image, but we only have a partial picture. And this is a lot uh, of what happens when we're trying to communicate information to folks too, right? We're all approaching the same thing from different angles. And it's important to be cognizant of that when we're designing programs, right? We can't just rely on words. That's one thing. We wanna help people see what we're talking about. And so, as I said before, communication is that switch to this structure that we're trying to build. It allows people to, to actually see what's happening and you cannot just rely on words to help people see. So that, that was kind of the, the, whole, the whole point. And I'm gonna invite people off mute to talk about a challenge that came up in your communication. And, and one thing that folks did effectively um, to help you to put the puzzle together. I invite, uh, anybody? Did you guys get it together, John? Yeah, Bonnie was fantastic. Didn't need a whole lot of direction. Um, yeah. I, I think we had uh, pretty good uh, communication. Hmm. What, what about what she did was helpful to you? Um, She, she was really good about describing the process that she was involved with and, um, uh, and describing um, uh, the, the, the questions that she was tussling with about how to uh, arrange these forms. Um, so, so I had a very good sense of uh, precisely what she was trying to do at almost every moment. Very cool, very cool. And, and I, I, I think we um, had, a, had a fairly similar language to, mm. to uh, you know, talk about the shapes and the actions. Um, uh, so there wasn't a lot of interpretation or questioning. Yeah, and that's a big deal, right? That speaks to accessibility. Do we literally speak the same language or do we have the same place that we're coming from as far as language and, and the, the signals that 
different words point to, you know, that's really big. Uh, did anyone have any challenges that they didn't mind sharing for the group? Uh, hang, on. Oh, hang on. Yep, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. It's not a challenge. We did the puzzle fairly quickly. Um, but I, I thought about something afterwards uh, that I think it is maybe helpful to know. I, so I was the B, was I B? Mm -hmm. I was giving instruction and I, I, I made sure that we were looking at the same components. I think that was, Sarah can say whether or not it was helpful, but mm -hmm. what I didn't do is see, and even though we put the puzzle together fairly quickly, I did not um, know or understand the parameters that she was working in like after she put it together she told me that she didn't have she didn't have the capacity to manipulate the pieces that they were in place and they just moved on a plane um so so i think that's important in understanding the other person's capacity you know when you're giving instruction or doing training your instructions can be crystal clear, but um, the person putting it together to carry the metaphor may not have the capacity uh, to execute the task, I guess. Definitely. Whether they haven't had that experience, whether they don't have the tools, you know, that's, that's a really valid point. So I appreciate you bringing that up. So much comes out of this for me, you know, just the idea of needing a feedback loop, being on the same page, having the capacity to follow the instructions, having the words to articulate, speaking the same language. I think this just tries to communicate the idea that one, the power of visualization is that it allows you to engage, right? And it allows you to engage in a way that you can build experience and gain the knowledge to, to upscale yourself to the point where you can actually do the thing. Or if the visualization is too complicated or the information is too complicated, how do you make it simpler, right? So that's definitely things I wanted us to take away from that. So here's an example of a visualization that's, you know, contextualized uh, that you would, you would use every day. You know, this is in context. And it speaks to some financial metrics. And, you know, it's in Spanish. So most of us here are probably English speakers and readers. And we can kind of see what it's saying, even if we don't know the way uh, to navigate and interpret an income statement, right? We see the shapes over here, looking at what proportion of our, of our, of our income, our expenses is allocated to what. We can kind of make out these different um, proportions and associate them with different things pretty quickly. And so I think this is something that we can uh, think about as we want to articulate different things. You know, we want to keep it simple. You don't want to have too many things. We've only got four sections here, right? We're looking at cost of goods. We're looking at payroll. We're looking at other costs and net profit, right? And this makes it really interesting. If this was up in your workspace or shared office space, it will have information that everybody can, can rely on, everybody can access and, and utilize in their dealings with the business. And I think it's also usually helpful to help people contextualize how they contribute to these metrics, right? And, and financial metrics aren't the only thing you're gonna be thinking about. You can be thinking about measuring social metrics, right? Like how many folks have attended the trainings, right? And you'd wanna keep it focused on the audience, the learners. You won't wanna measure how many trainings you offered necessarily. You'd want to think about how do we visualize how many people are attending the trainings. And you can go to the environmental dimension, right? How are we dealing with waste, right? And create visuals so folks can, can gather up how we're dealing with waste, uh, waste effectively, right? So, so these are a few pieces of, of how you can think about visualizing stuff, right? It doesn't have to be complicated. 
you want to keep it simple and you want to provide training so folks can continue to understand and improve their skills as they engage with the material. I wanted to also share an example of, uh, of a visual that could be not helpful in context, in the cooperative context, right? So you've got Tom, Susie, Darren, and Lakme here, and maybe they're at a pharmaceutical company and the, the manager is thinking, how do we get more sales? So he creates this visual, puts it on a wall, and now they're all competing with each other to get the most sales, right? He's thinking this is gonna be great for sales. However, you know, Lakme hits it out the park. She went to college with most of the doctors. And so Tom gives up, you know, and that drives sales downward for the entire team, right? Or now there's infighting and you create a negative culture. And so you're thinking about how visuals can help or hurt, right? You don't just necessarily create something that's really pretty or put something up that you want people to pay attention to. You, you make sure that they're going to be moving towards the right goals as you create these visualization. And, you know, I, I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts or examples, but, but these are definitely things that we encourage you guys to think about. And so we, we have another activity for you guys. And I'll bring Carolyn back on. Yeah, so um, in a second, this is, we're not gonna send you into breakout rooms for this one, uh, which is gonna ask you to do this exercise on your own. Um, we're going to put a link in the chat. Um, John, will you click through the... There we go. Um, we're gonna put a link in the chat and um, there will be a bunch of different slides. They're all exactly the same. So just pick one that's blank and put your name on it. Um, and you're gonna see that graphic again of the four corner posts of power, knowledge, information. Um, and um, you've got a few little stars as a little like gallery of stars that you can use. You just pull, uh, pull a star down to whatever the top two or three areas are where you feel like your co-op um, could benefit from training, education, and information. Um, and then once you've sort of identified the top areas that you'd like to focus on or that your co-op could benefit from, um, think about what resources you have or, or need to make that training possible. Um, and there's a space in the bottom of the slide where you can, can put those resources. And that might be you know, people in your network, um, an industry or sector group that offers training resources um, other things. I'm going to give you about five minutes to do that on your own, and then we'll come back and, and share back. Um, any questions about that? All right, and you can, you know, if you want to turn off your video or whatever, feel free. Common is anything standing out to folks as a, a, a common need? I see some people sort of start specific smaller areas like participatory management and leadership skills. And some people just were like, we need help with money. <laughs> we need help with people with the entire big areas. Yeah, as you reflect on your own needs and as you scroll through the gallery to see other folks' needs, you know, what's coming up, feel free to drop it in the chat or mute yourself. Uh, I think yep. one thing I notice, and, and it's kind of how I feel, um, is that there doesn't seem to be a central resource to go to. There's lots of scattered resources, and uh, it would be nice if, if there were a, a book on how to co-op or how to cooperate. Uh, and I know that doesn't exist, and it doesn't exist because of the complexities of all of it. But uh, sometimes feel like um, 
dropped on an island without a map, and I'm just trying to circumnavigate the wilderness here. So Barbara's recommending in the chat, Cooperatives for a Better World has good resources. Um, I'll also say at the end of the presentation, we've got a few different resources um, and that that book that you're talking to, it's not the be all end all, but um, earlier this year, the Democracy at Work Institute published a um, democratic management training guide that does have, has a lot of pieces. Um, it has a lot of good kind of worksheets and checklists and here's how to facilitate a discussion on such and such topic for your co-op. Um, and again, while it's worker co-op focused, I think it's um, well, actually everybody except for Bonnie who's left on here as a worker co-op anyway. But um, I think a lot of it is broadly applicable like with a little bit of translation to other sectors. Um, and US Federation of Worker Co-ops also um, is I think in the process of updating and doing a little bit more um, resource provision on their website too. But I, I would I would encourage people to check out that democratic management guide. Bonnie. Oh, I don't know. You're muted if you were talking. Oops. Hey, everyone. <laughs> I was struck yesterday because I was trying to pair up a new general manager hired by one of our food co-ops that has no grocery experience with a with a you know with an experienced and successful general manager and I said to him you know please share manuals please share this and he said I have 800 pages of stuff I can share but no one's going to read it he said if if you want training come and shadow me on the job and I think there's a both and right I think we I think having policies all the things that you need to create as a new cooperative are important but I was really struck by that. And I was like, oh yeah, job shadowing that you learn so much more in action and by watching other people. So I was, I, it's just been, it keeps coming up for me and I keep thinking about, well, how could we help with that? Because you really do, even if the cooperative is not the same type of co-op, I imagine even among worker co-ops being like, can I shadow a board meeting to see how that works? Can I shadow a meeting? So that's, that's what came up as a resource that I hadn't considered as much earlier. Yeah, I completely agree. I think in the cooperative world, the people are tended to kind of be the source, you know? And so you, you dip into that source to the people, the people around you, the people in the organization, and you start there, you know, and you kind of get a handle for what we already know and run up to our limits and, and then try to make friends with other people <laughs> and get to know what they know. So I hear you. All right. Any other thoughts on that one? As you're seeing what other folks are struggling with, I see a lot of power and, and information. You gonna say something, Carolyn? No. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, cool. Should we keep rocking? Let's keep rocking. Um, I, I do love, Sarah, the idea of um, a session on each of the pillars. Um, and that's another thing actually that, uh, so Democracy at Work Institute, I think they've structured this now as a self-paced little uh, course. They used to run a monthly democratic management skills check-in. And now I think you can just do like an online assessment. Um, but I think the intention is very much that, that's to, um, I, Kevin had also made the comment of like, I don't know where to, what training we need. Um, it is intended to do exactly that, to help you sort of assess for each of the pillars, how are you doing and what are areas that, um, where you could use, you know, use some more help. Um, yeah, let's keep rocking. Um, so one thing that I hear co-ops struggle with a lot, and I'm, I'm like pleasantly surprised I didn't hear this from anybody here, is like just where do we find the time to train? Um, and I think particularly for worker co-ops, there's a real pressure between like the operational, we need to be, you know, making the tempeh, 
printing the things, um, making the shirts. Um, and we need to be taking time to onboard new members and train and talk about what is this all about anyway. Um, and I, you know, I guess I would just say from experience, um, so before I came to CFNE, I worked for Yard and a Half Landscaping Co-op and we were a co-op conversion. So people were really good at building stone walls and laying pavers and pruning trees. What was really hard though was learning to speak up in meetings and sit with conflict in a productive way and um, even figure out how we were gonna make decisions together. And um, I just wanna you know, sort of be a, uh, an evangelist for the idea that you kind of have to go slow to go fast and that it is worth investing the time in training and education because it makes you a lot more effective. It cuts down on a lot of the friction at, that comes from, you know, role confusion or um, lack of alignment around values. Um, and it's something that you can budget for. So, you know, if you have a good sense, if you take the time to do the assessment of what are the top two or three things that would make a big difference to our effectiveness if we had a good understanding of them? Um, and then go ahead and figure out, you know, who who could train you on that? Can you get mentorship from another co-op? Um, can you get, uh, you know, sometimes even workforce development from like in Massachusetts, um, the workforce development fund will match 50% if you get training on certain things. So for a lot of those more operational things, maybe not so much for governance, but like if you need sales training, yeah, a lot of times you can get, you know, a matching grant for half of that. Um, and also is there stuff in your own industry where, uh, where there are, are trainings on, you know, whether it's safety or whatever it is. Yeah. And I would add that <clears throat> it's always happening. You know, folks are being, uh, put in a position where they're learning from somebody, something, your processes at all times, you know, it's kind of the basis of their experience. They're learning uh, what is right, what is wrong, what's not happening, and it's all kind of grounded in your culture. And so, you know, it's, it's happening anyway. And so how do you kind of create the conditions for that to happen in the right direction? Uh, even if you don't have a formal training budget, you know, when you're mentoring, when you're sending out policies, everything you're doing is educating your members about how to, how to behave and what's the right thing to do so. I think it's always happening and there's a cost to not doing it. That is pretty big that we don't calculate. And so it's kind of up to you to think about that. So we, we've got some controversial questions, potentially. Let's keep things a little spicy. So the first one, should co-ops consider setting competency requirements for those wishing to stand for elected office? You guys can unmute it, drop it in the chat, let's dive in. Who says yay or nay and why? Now, of course, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but certainly worth discussing. Yes, I'm just, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's a different question to ask yes barbara tell us um yeah not sure about competence requirements but maybe participation honestly. yeah i was thinking instead of so i would say no <laughs> but I, I it's not just a black or white you know thing it's um the, uh, the question I would, would ask is how can we uh, prepare someone to stand for elected office? How, how do we get that person um, feeling able and, and competent? How do we build competency? I guess that's, that's what I would ask. 
so that that person can job shadow for a while until they're, I don't know, maybe I'm being too idealistic. Yeah. Well, and it definitely. kind of comes back to um, what Issa was talking about at the beginning, too, of what somebody needs to be prepared completely depends on where they're starting from. Um, and so it's going to depend on the person. So there's, um, you know, it would be hard to necessarily have a curriculum that you say people are going to need to go through because each person's going to come with different, you know, strengths and areas of challenge. Um, but the goal is that any member should be able to stand for elected office. So how do we get them to that point? Yeah. And it's really a, a question of accessibility. You know, uh, a lot of the times we are going to restrict folks who come in with different language abilities or different understandings. And, you know, that's not really in the spirit of cooperation, you know. There might even be scheduling conflicts, right? Some folks are in the field, some folks are in the house. It's easier for folks in the house to deal with the admin or the, the meetings requirement. And so, you know, they're cut off. And so you, you wanna think much more broadly about competency and how we're building it, as, as you already said, because, you know, the cooperative solution is grounded in education. It's grounded in people empowerment because you can focus on outsourcing that with somebody who already came prepared to have that or finding someone outside of the organization. But that doesn't really strengthen the, 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 the cooperative, right? It's kind of the corporate solution. So thinking of outsourcing versus education or if folks come prepared for that or how do we make leadership accessible to everyone? Because that's really the point of the education so that everyone can get access to, to making the cooperative uh, enterprise a successful one. Okay. One, can I say one more thing about this? Absolutely. Um, for people who, I don't know if anybody here came to the training on autonomy and independence, but uh, it's really interesting that this is an area that is kind of identified as where education and training butt up against or support undergird um, independence. Because the idea is that if you train up from within and your leaders are coming up from within, and it's not just your managers, it's you know anybody in the co-op, um, that helps the co-op be stronger and more independent versus having to depend on an external consultant or advisor or non-voting board member or what have you. Yep. Definitely. All right, <clears throat> I saw some more comments in the chat, definitely. Let's go to the next one. Should co-ops help members learn skills that apply beyond their work? Right? Should they learn personal budgeting and civic engagement and rules of democracy or, or even English? Is the co-op responsible for that? Yes, we got some activity in the chat. For sure. <laughs> so everyone's basically in alignment here. Maybe it's not controversial <laughs> till it comes up in a meeting, maybe. But uh, yeah, I think we all agree, you know, um, in the cooperative space, personal development is professional development, right? The more fulfilled as people we are, the more we're able to contribute as professionals to the endeavor. So I think, um, I think we're all in agreement here, but it's something worth exploring. Anything to add, Kyla? Oh, I mean, just one of the one of the funny places where this comes up is um, when you have a co-op that you know has a goal of wealth building. It creates this new need where people have some wealth; they have some discretionary income. They're getting a patronage check at the end of the year, um, and they have to actually budget for that and figure out, okay, what's going to be the impact on my taxes? What can I do with this money? Can I buy a house? Can, you know, it, it actually like, it can kick the whole personal finance conversation up a level and also create a lot of insecurity for people who are like, I never thought I would have the problem of trying to figure out what to do with discretionary income, um, which is a cool problem to have. And um, I think it's great when co-ops say, 
we're going to bring in an accountant to help people figure out how to do their taxes or how to deal with that you're getting like a certain amount of your patronage in cash, but that it's really the intent is that it be used to cover your taxes down the road. Um, so yeah, you know, it's like, it, it creates a new exciting set of areas for growth of personal growth through involvement with the co-op. Yeah. And I'll add that, you know, as Carolyn already mentioned, you know, Mondragon, Rochdale, early African-American cooperatives, they all started with a grander vision than just engaging in business, you know, just engaging in skills. You know, you wanted citizens who can be literate in, in many different areas. And you're really thinking of this people empowerment tool as opposed to just, you know, uh, meeting needs in a, in a business sense. So very, very important if you can do it. And so <clears throat> let's do the last question I'm gonna provoke you guys into answering. Uh, what's an appropriate percentage of your budget to allocate for education, for training or for information uh, sharing? Drop your answers in the chat or mute yourselves. So Bonnie left just in time because I was going to put her on the spot for this mm. one uh, because um, food co-ops are, are probably the one co-op that like most consistently, I think, you know, has, a, has a public education line in their budget um, because they see that as a way to bring, you know, it's, it's a form of promotion to bring on new members. Um, but I think we could argue for, hey, you know, more awareness of co-ops in general makes all of our co-ops stronger. Definitely, you know, I see that connecting to a marketing line item and other things like that, the information piece and um, the broadness of education or the specificity of training. I think those are things that could be negotiated and talked about. Do we have any immediate responses or feed, uh, you know, just, just inclinations around these things? <laughs> Barbara says, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'll say most people don't. You know, industry standards exist, you know, put 3%, 10%. I know these early groups that we talked about wish they could do 10% um, more than that, but um, there's no standard. There's no standard. I think you have to set your own standard according to your own values and what's needed and recognize that these things are gonna change over time. In the beginning, if you're a group who's considering creating a co-op, you know, that is money that doesn't exist yet. You're just all getting educated. As you hire people, you're focused probably on training, getting the job done and you're trying to bring in a broader community because that's going to help everybody uh, throughout the entire process. So it, it really depends on what you're doing and what your feel is, I think. Anything else from anyone? All right. So now that we've asked you some questions, Will allow you to ask us some questions uh, that are not predetermined, and you know we can talk about it in these final five to ten minutes. Hey, Kevin, can you guys talk a little bit more about the the funding sources for training um, and and how we can go about kind of peeling that back? I, I know you had said was it Mass MEP you were talking about, Carolyn? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure what it's, it's the, it's just the workforce training, uh, center. Okay. And unfortunately, I don't know what the equivalent is in other states or if they even have, you know, exactly the same, but I would say that that's always a good place to, to look is, is there state money? Um, in Massachusetts also, we have, um, small business technical assistance program. Uh, that makes grants to, um, to TA providers to provide services. Um, but, you know, CFNE and LEAF and a few other co-op providers are part of that program. Um, so again, it's a thing where if you, um, who are the co-op developers active in your state? Do they have access to that type of funding? Um, 
that's certainly how we're able to do a lot of the free um, free support that we do. Yeah, definitely. And if you're connected and, to a city, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think also, um, you know, distinguishing different buckets. So there might be different buckets of funding available for something that's directly sort of workforce training related to doing the job versus cooperative development. Um, you might be able to get a capacity building grant for leadership development, you know, if you're um, working with sort of underrepresented or underserved communities, for instance, um, there might be more philanthropic money available for leadership development that serves to strengthen the co-op. Um, one other thing to say is, um, how do you get grants as a for-profit business? Um, so some, some grants you'll need to work with a fiscal sponsor, um, CFNE, you know, or other nonprofits uh, potentially can, can do that um, to help you manage grant funds. Um, but also it's worth having a conversation with cooperative developers or other trainers to you know, understand what are their funding sources? Are there things that they can offer you? Yeah, definitely. Just just echoing that, you know, if you are trying to find grants, which are difficult for for profits, you know, you're looking at capacity building grants. You know, that's that's usually how that be framed. You know, you might be talking to your local municipal office, the development office, and, and they may have some interest in supporting that. You know, and if you're connected to a CDFI, they're gonna usually have a training and technical assistance arm who is really interested in providing these things, you know, so no, no cost to you. So go ahead, Kevin or Kevin Associate. Well, I was gonna say, so as a for-profit then, can we partner with CFNE to do a grant to do specific trainings? I'm just looking quickly through the catalog of trainings on the Mass Workforce Training Fund, and they're very business specific, um, but, I think we're looking for more training that's cooperative specific. Yeah, so um, I mean, a couple of things. One is that there are definitely people working on getting more of the stuff that co-ops need to operate recognized as, you know, as a workforce skill. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, also, you probably would want to look at other, um, you know, whether it's Cooperative Development Institute, Worcester Roots, and, you know, pick your local uh, co-op yeah. developer and yeah. understand with them um, what are they, what are they funded to, to do? Because, um, yeah. Yeah, appreciate that question, Kevin. I hope you covered some of the options there. A anybody else or any more to say on that? I guess the other piece would be knowing, um, you know, where you're located or if there are um, types of grant funding that are targeted to your area, whether that's like a gateway city or a rural area or, you know, whatever. Um, and again, that might be, you know, starting with a conversation with whoever you want to, to provide the technical assistance or provide the training um, and see if those pockets of money exist. Yeah, yeah I would agree. Most of that money is definitely place based. So you gotta know, uh, and we can speak to you personally based on what your local ecosystem is, but there'll be an actor interested in some way, shape or form. Barbara, were you gonna say something? Oh, okay. Excellent. All right. Well, if um, there are no more questions that we can dive into right now, 
I know we have a few resources. Some are mentioned, some are not. Uh, I don't know. You want to talk about some of these, Karen? Um, not really. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, so the Democratic Management uh, Guide, that second resource there is the one that I was mentioning earlier. And um, when you guys get the slides, you know, these are, are linked in there. Um, and, um, the, you know, the other ones are more generally focused on co-op principles. So um, more background than necessarily like pragmatic. Um, Yeah. 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 And there's and I'll lots add, of- add, um, go ahead. You know, Barbara, thank you for the suggestion about Cooperatives for a Better World. I'll add that link. And also before I send this out to make sure we capture that for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's lots of paid trainings, of course, out there through Cooperation Works and the USDA and stuff like that, that folks can tap into or, or see what's available. Lots of developers in those networks, folks willing to talk to you. I think each other is a really good resource, you know, just getting to know other folks in your sector or cross sector or talking to us and us helping you make those connections. But I really believe it's a, a people powered movement, even though, you know, there are definitely resources that are published that there's definitely formal things that you may not know that you really like, really like to dive into from a technical perspective. But I think, you know, people, it, it really starts with well, uh, recognizing that you know something and that's enough to get started and someone else knows a little something too and you guys can all put together for a picture and, and we're here for you as well so reach out so for those of you who are interested in that book an appointment with us you can email or call and we can talk more specifically about your area as we said most of these resources are going to be place-based and help you design a program or you know, speak to, to some of your folks at a board meeting quickly, the different things we can help with and, you know, reach out for us to explore that together. All right. And just, well, I mean, just to underscore that offer, yep. um, you know, a few folks said, I don't even know where to start. Um, happy to just like think through it with you and come up with, just lay out what's, what are the two or three things that would be most impactful and start thinking about how would you find the money for it? Who could you work with, et cetera? Um, because sometimes just starting out with a plan, even if it takes you a couple of years to really get there, um, might get you on the, right, on the right path. So we're always happy to have those conversations. I'm excited to have that discussion with you. Uh, <laughs> you know how to get me, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, pausing and having a chance to talk about this stuff, which I personally tend to keep inside a lot, so. Everybody's going through it. I mean, that's the other nice thing about these conversations is you just get to remember that like, yeah, every co-op is facing these things. Thank you all, it's good seeing you all. Yes, thank you guys. Take care.